So I've been asked to talk about software quality. And um, to me, this is a, a very, uh, very real type of topic. Um, I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story. So it goes all the way back to 1986. I was in high school, um, and I still had a few years left of, of school before I went to college. And some event happened that had uh, a bigger impact on my life than I would realize at the time. We were actually watching the space shuttle launch, uh, the Challenger launch, when it blew up. We actually were watching this at the time, and I still remember seeing it go up and then seeing it explode. And, you know, the shuttle exploded. All seven that were on board died. Uh, there was really no way that that could have, you know, not happened. Um, and the background to it uh, was investigated, and there were several reports generated. The Rogers Commission was one report that generated a lot of findings. Now, that was, you know, that had Feynman, it had uh, Chuck Yeager, it had Neil Armstrong, it had a lot of big names on the report. It had a big impact on sort of the controversy of what led to, the ch to, to Challenger exploding. But the one that actually had the longest long-term result was this one. This is the National, Science, uh, National Research Council report on talking about um, the evaluation of the space shuttle risk assessment and management. Okay, what this really means is what, how, wh what was the pro uh, pro processes and things in place for the shuttle to look at how it handled risk and how it made its decision of whether to go or not and everything else around it. Now, this came out two years after, so around 1988 um, that this came out. A few years after that, one of the recommendations was, even though software played no role that they could find in the shuttle disaster, one of the things that was identified as an area of risk was safety around software. So one of the recommendations was to implement a program called Independent Verification and Validation that was to initially talk about how the shuttle, the software on the shuttle, the software around the shuttle, the simulations around the shuttle that were software related would be handled with the risk associated with, with the shuttle. That led to this building being, being made, uh, which you can, can't quite see, but it says West Virginia University, NASA IV&V facility. And sort of this building, its primary role was to provide a mechanism so that all the software systems that touch anything within NASA that is deemed critical, it could be evaluated. And one of the authors of that National Research Council report was a woman named Nancy Levison. And she had a profound impact on my, the way that I think about software from a couple different reasons, but one of them is her, her ideas of safety. So we usually think of safety, and we'll see how quality relates to it, is that safety isn't something you design into each component. It's an emergent property. Now, you may have aspects of safety that are in components, but if there isn't an emergent pro pro property of the system which talks about safety, you're really missing something, right? If you design something which has each component responsible for safety, but there's no overarching entity around it that keeps it safe, it will not be a safe system. So this, this actually had quite a profound impact on me because software safety and mission safety for NASA is something that I spent almost the first decade of my career working on. So I worked with systems on shuttle. I worked with systems that used control the shuttle until it reaches the top of that antenna. I worked on systems that take over after that point. I worked on systems that were around just the shuttle setting on this pad weeks before it actually takes off. Systems that are used to get the shuttle to the pad. Systems that are done for simulation of the shuttle on ascent. Simulations of shuttle on orbit. I got to first as a student be exposed to these systems and later as you know, a full researcher looking at various ways we can take and make the software systems better. But it's more than that. It's the mission safety, not just the safety of everyone that's tied to the shuttle. 
One of the systems I got to work on was this glass cockpit in the shuttle. Originally, this was not all glass. In other words, not all displays. It was actually hard-coded, wired systems. And, you know, the shuttle is one of the more complex pieces of machinery that we have done. This is actually a very small piece of it. The whole system that is handling the shuttle is a vast system that covers pretty much the whole entire globe. There's systems all over the place for it. But it's not just about shuttle. I was fortunate enough to work on pieces of the space station as it was being you know, uh, put up as well. And so this started out as a small, kind of this, this kind of size, and it grew over a number of years and a number of billions of dollars. Uh, to be a fairly large system. It's also fairly complex. Some of these systems are, de are designed and built by lots of different entities, and they have to all work together. So, seen a lot of that. How big do you think the teams that worked on just making sure that some of the software involved was shuttle and station, how big do you think the teams that are designed to make sure that, the, from an independent perspective, to verify and validate that this, all this software works, how big do you think these teams really are? Hundreds of people? No. They're that small. So, this is kind of interesting. A lot of times, these, these projects, the ones responsible for making sure that these things work, are not just a small team. It's actually the whole entire team, but the ones who actually sign off on it and who do the majority of a lot of that work are usually fairly small. They, a lot of times, don't have a very big budget either. But it's not just, you know, when people could die. Uh, Cassini, Cassini Space Probe, going to Saturn and doing a lot of different things. It's just now finished its mission. You know, Cassini was a project that started out and was very rocky. There were... Some, there were always issues in all kinds of spacecraft. Cassini was no different. There's a lot of different things that uh, the design of Cassini uh, uncovered and had to be taking, uh, taken into account. Some of the more challenging things are the Mars rovers. Both Cassini and the Mars rovers had a lot of autonomy. How do you make sure that systems will behave safely or even that they do their job when you can't even really anticipate what some of the input conditions can be? or the fact that there may be something that you don't know that they encounter. How do you do that? Well, it all comes down to quality. Safety starts with quality. You can't have a safe system without it being quality. You could by accident, maybe, but you'd rather be much more deliberate about it, right? So when you think about quality of software that we develop, do you expect it to work? Ask people that are not in our discipline. Ask, you know, your, your mother or your father, your grandfather, grandmother, aunts, uncles, people who have very little knowledge about, you know, computers and about software systems. Ask them if they trust software to work. And I'm serious about this. Ask, ask people that have no relation to, you know, the, the, our industry at all, if they expect software to work. Heck, ask ourselves, right? Do we expect software to work? All the time? No, we don't. It's not simple, right? But if we don't, ourselves don't expect it to work, how can we expect you know, there, to, there to be quality there? With large projects, from the 2010 Standish Group Chaos Report, you know, Martin and I have showed this before, a lot of times, you know, projects, successes, were not very good. I mean, if it was 32% of the time, you know, that it, it seems that a bridge works, that would be pretty bad, right? We wouldn't expect that. But that's kind of normal for large projects, large software projects. To be challenged 44% of the time, almost half the time they have at least one problem that substantially delays their, their introduction or their actual operation. And 24% of the time they just plain outright fail. Is this good? No. No, this is terrible. <laughs> We're also the only industry, and I've been looking, that actually has in its end-user license agreement that you can't hold us responsible if this doesn't work. Does this make us feel good about it? 
No, this doesn't add any confidence to asking you know, our relatives and other people about if they think software is going to work. Software quality actually matters. And you know, we could use a lot of different ways about thinking about this. So what I want to sort of do is, you know, initially here, sort of get us an idea of what software quality really means. Well, one of the reasons, one of the things we could do is to say that a system meeting its functional requirements is quality. You know, almost a binary thing. It either has quality or it doesn't. And if we look at this and we break it down, let's look at those words. You know, Robin Williams' quote about, you know, sort of words and ideas can change the world has actually a meaningful effect here. Because when I said functional requirements, what I'm not saying is non-functional requirements. Or what are non-functional requirements? Let me give you a, a list of them. Performance, quality, robustness, safety, stability, usability. There's a lot more. So if these are non-functional requirements and the system doesn't meet some of these, does it mean that the system is not non-functional? Well, let's break that down. It's non-functional and it's not would be turn that into functional. So when these non-functional requirements are not met, the system is functional? Words matter, right? Words can change the world. If we think about it this way, this is a really poor choice of words. In fact, here's a list of just some from Wikipedia of non-functional requirements. You know, there's performance, quality, portability, readability, reliability, you know, reporting, resilience, response time, reusability, you know, security, we know that this one, right? And stability, backup, availability, auditability. Words matter. Our choice of these kind of basically says that we devalue these over more functional requirements. What really non-functional requirements are is unspoken or incomplete functional requirements. If you go to anyone who's working on some of these systems and you ask them to say something about quality, they will say, this system needs to be of quality. Well, why isn't that in the, in the, in the requirements then? Oh, well, we just assumed that. Well, okay, that might work. Uh, a lot of times it doesn't. Because, and this just, this does not just mean quality. If you take a look at performance, you take a look at usability, a lot of things, they, they really become afterthoughts. And if we look at our, you know, our sort of industry, quality at best is an afterthought. Because quality itself isn't an issue, unless it suddenly is, right? The quality, and this could be, you could replace the quality with security or scalability or any of these things. It's something that you didn't think would happen, and all of a sudden, when it does happen, or it lack, of, lack of it happening, it all of a sudden becomes a crisis. Because we ask ourselves, what could possibly go wrong, right? What could possibly happen you know, that we haven't accounted for? We like to think we're good at this. A lot of times we say this jokingly, and then we are proven exactly wrong. So what is our response when something like this happens? All of a sudden, quality of our product or something happens. What is our reaction? I've seen this happen a number of times. First thing you do is, you don't know exactly how bad your quality is, so you start throwing testers at it, just randomly testing things. And you uncover issues because you're randomly throwing testers at it. And they're uncovering things that were not in the functional requirements. You then slap a patch on it, ship it out, pat yourself on the back, you know, for finding all these issues, and you think you're good. But you want to prevent it in the future. So you institute mandatory source code reviews, so more eyes look on changes. And you have so many bugs that you institute bug triage meetings so that you can prioritize exactly how bad you've been. We do this all the time. Now, this is good. This is a reaction that we have to have, but let's not fool ourselves. This is a placebo, right? We're doing this because we have had an issue. We want to try to prevent as many issues going forward, but we haven't gotten to the root cause of what caused all the problem to begin with. The only problem is, is that we sometimes stop at that. 
So quality, you know, it's not something that you can patch after the fact when you discover issues. It has to be something that we take up front. What quality isn't? Now, the nice thing about looking at a lot of the projects that I got to look at at NASA was they covered a lot of different things. They covered a lot of different technologies. They covered a lot of languages. They covered a lot of different ground. And they did a lot of different things. And I can tell you that when I look at these projects, and I look at even things going forward that are not related to NASA and a lot of things that I'm involved with, I can tell you that quality does not come because you've chosen Agile versus Waterfall or Scrum. It has nothing to do with language choice. Just because you're using Java doesn't mean that you all of a sudden get to just completely forget about certain aspects of the system, because it will come back and bite you. Your framework or library choice that you have will have no impact. Formal methods that you use, they may help. The, them alone will not solve this. Functional versus imperative or, uh, or object-oriented programming has no relationship to quality. Reference enterprise architectures, we may love them, we may, or architects might love them. They might, it may be great to impose them on an organization so that there's you know, consistency across different things. It has nothing to do with quality. Your vendor stack has nothing to do with quality. Now, does that mean that you can just pick any vendor? Perhaps. It may not matter as much as you think, and it definitely doesn't matter as much as some people will tell you it does. The reason why a lot of these things are not, have nothing to do with quality is really because dogma, the act of just blindly applying these things and assuming that you get an end result is the opposite of quality. You know, what you should take away from language choice, frameworks, formal methods, functional, you know, reference architectures, vendor stacks, process, is really inspiration. And this quote from Bob Dylan is great for that. The highest purpose of art is to inspire. What else can you do? What else can you do for anyone but inspire them, right? Languages are inspirational. You get to learn a language and you get to learn how it wants to represent things and how it wants you to work through its idioms. Java, C, C++, C Sharp, Python, Erlang, OCaml, Ada, et cetera. These are just some exa uh, different examples. Even JavaScript, there's a lot of inspiration we can get. Now, maybe in the case of JavaScript, it might be more of the things you shouldn't do. But we can say that about all these languages. And that's because there is no silver bullet. Fred Brooks in 1986, also from 1986, was totally right about this. If you've never read this article, you should. This is in IEEE uh, Explore, uh, but it's also been a lot of other places. Um, what I'm saying is nothing new. This has been going on for a vastly long period of time. There is no silver bullet to making things good, to making them of quality. There is nothing that we can do. There is no shortcut. We don't get it just by choosing a language. We don't get it just by choosing a framework or a library, no matter what people want you to think. Because what quality is, is actually one uncomfortable truth. And we've seen this. Think about projects you've seen that have been successful, ones that you think have resulted in software that was really good, really robust, did its job exceedingly well. We think about it as an uncomfortable truth, but maybe it's comfortable. Because what it actually consists of is pride, ownership, and responsibility. Now, we might get certain things from a language. Java is great for certain aspects of it. The JVM is a great piece of machinery. And we get a lot of benefit from using it. But if you're sloppy about things, it still won't be any better. You'll still have null pointer exceptions in your code. You'll still have unhandled exceptions. You'll still have a lot of things that prevent availability unless you take pride, ownership, and responsibility in what is being produced. So pride is a personal commitment. You know, it separates you know, excellence from mediocrity, the quote by William Blake. And this is pretty true, right? 
you can't, a, a team itself can't have pride unless every member has some amount of pride, right? It's awfully hard to have the team be prideful in a piece of software that they have developed unless every member has at least some pride in it. And we typically do. And you can tell the pride and ownership and responsibility that comes by the way that people talk about aspects of the system. And this is something that I noticed from you know, lots of different teams that I work with. So to give you an idea of what I did with NASA and got exposed to a lot of these projects is I was a researcher. I would come in and help the team figure out what type of analysis they should do to make sure the system was safe what kind of things they could do, how they could look at the system. So I got exposed to a lot of different teams, a lot of different systems. And so I'll give you an example. It struck me with one team that every member of the team used this type of language. When they were talk about a component, they would say, I do this, the I being this component. They had personalized it to the point where they themselves were that component. I do this. To contrast that to someone on the team who says it does this, that's a little different, right? It seems a little bit of isolation, a little bit of divorcing it from myself. Now it's an it. And I met one team that they didn't talk about I, they talked about we. So it was even more of accepting that it's not just myself, it's the whole team. So this simple thing of how the different components of the system are referred to shows a lot. It shows a lot of pride in what they're doing, a lot of ownership and a lot of responsibility that they take just from that simple usage. Now, that's not the actual cause of what produced quality within that team. It's a symptom of it, right? So think about that. You know, if you catch yourself doing, I do this, or it does this, or we do this, you know, that, that way that that's being spoken of is probably saying a lot. So here's a great quote from Pat Summit. She's one of the, um, she was the Tennessee Volunteers uh, women's basketball coach for a number of years. She's one of the most uh, winningest coaches in any sport, male or female. And I love this quote in that responsibility equals accountability equals ownership. And a sense of ownership is the most powerful weapon a team or organization can have. Now this is usually, this is like mostly management speak, right? We think about you know, management talking about accountability and responsibility. But let's think about it from our perspective as engineers. The things that we're designing and building. Can you think of you know, any reason why looking at it from our perspective and our ownership of that as being a bad thing? No. Does it give us a lot of, you know, a powerful weapon that we can build better things? Yes. And I'll say, the projects that I saw at NASA, this is exactly it. You know, a lot of my job as a researcher was to find the tools, techniques, and everything else that were good for teams. And I would love to stand up and say, here's a whole list of things that you should do. And there are a few things, and we'll cover them. But honestly, taking pride, ownership, and responsibility, putting that on your back as a team, I've seen it over and over produce quality stuff. And it's, it's a necessary part of that. But I think going forward, we either take responsibility or we let things like this happen. So this is just a snippet of the New York Times article about the engineer at Volkswagen that got 40 months uh, in prison for his role in, you know, fudging the diesel emissions coming out uh, of, of, their, of their diesel um, SUVs. There's a couple things that is chilling just of, just of this. The engineers were put and shown that they were responsible, not management. This engineer was given a 40-month sentence after he had a plea deal with the prosecutors. In other words, he said, I'll turn over exactly as much information as I can, but you look after me. And, you know, you would think a whistleblower like that wouldn't get any jail time. Well, 40 months is not exactly, you know, no jail time, right? 
I think what I took about this was not so much that, you know, if I do something that management wants or I, or I do something that, you know, is detrimental, that I'm going to be held accountable. What I take from this is that the time where, you know, people would look at us as engineers and not hold us accountable for our decisions as software engineers is over. They will. Now, this is not looking at really having a harsh impact and potentially damaging for anything more than the automaker. Because what it really is is that guilty conspiracy to defraud the United States and violate the Clean Air Act. That has impact, but it doesn't have immediate impact on safety or cost someone their life. So it's going to be interesting to see what happens. I think what is happening is this, and I've thought about it for a long time. We are kind of bad as an industry at producing quality stuff. And we've had for a long time sort of this pass of, well, software is new. And so that we got a, you know, kind of a, you know, a pass that we could be a little loose, we could play a little fast with things, and that's over. What we need to do is to be a lot better as an industry and hold ourselves and our industry a little bit more accountable. Because I think that we're going to see more things like this and not fewer. The days where it is easy enough to put a EULA up and say, we are not responsible for the consequences of what happens here, is going to be over. Some smart lawyer is going to figure out that software is bad in general and is going to totally negate that result. They're going to figure out a way to hold companies, you know, in, uh, you know, responsible for their bad software. They're going to sue them. And our industry has to be ready to account, to account for that, whether it be us as engineers or not. How many of you have a background that's not software related, but is an other engineer related, like maybe a computer engineer, electrical engineer, um, or anything like that? Okay. Say you're an electrical engineer. I am by my, myself. I'm actually an electrical engineer, you know, by training. One of the things that I had to take before I could graduate was an ethics course. And in that ethics course, we were put on trial because of a decision that we made as an electrical engineer that cost somebody their life. We had to defend ourselves, defend our decisions, defend our actions. This is not, for an electrical engineer, this is not something that, you know, that is uncommon. It happens, in the States at least. So, does it happen often? Usually not. But, you have to be ready to defend your decision and why you chose it. As an engineer, it's time that software grew up to that standard. How comfortable would you be if you were put on trial from the result of something? Let's just say it wasn't even somebody losing their life. It was just a company that lost money. And now you're put on trial to defend your choice of language or library. Would you be comfortable getting in front of, getting in front of a, a jury and saying, we chose Angular because... So we do need to grow up a little bit. And I think we will. So, you've all come to this conference, and you're going to be here for today and tomorrow, and you're going to see a lot of different presentations. And I kind of wanted to give you something to kind of look at, you know, for your, for your boss, right? If you have a boss, and they said, hey, this is a great conference, why don't you go? Or you said, hey, this is a great conference, I'd like to go. Here's one thing they can take away from this. There was some work done on a lot of the different projects that I was involved in that looked on the return on investment of this IV and V practice, of having an independent entity come in and verify and validate and find issues and work with the team. And what did we find? Well, first thing is, here's a list of some of the references that if you're really interested in the, looking at this, you can. And here's a, little, a few more people to look at that have things to say about this in this area. But as the pointy hair boss thing, the things that stand out as being useful beyond that pride, ownership, and responsibility is specifications and requirements 
documents are meaningless, except for the fact that they provide a nice communication mechanism that is you know, very explicit, and they provide you with definite formal thinking. So think of specifications as being a communication mechanism. We'll talk a little bit more about that. Early on in the process, the more people you can get, especially experts in a domain, to look at that communication, that specification, the requirements, whatever it is, and to ask what if questions. Those are things you don't have to deal with later on when you ship, because you'll have them up front. So the earlier that you can get to look at requirements and analyze them, the earlier that you can have someone who really knows their stuff look and ask questions, the more it pays off. And the last thing is culture of accountability. If you have a culture which is holding themselves and others within the team accountable and responsibility, it's a lot harder to make problems uh, you know, or, make, or, make, or for issues to arise later on. So, you know, if we, look at, if we look at this, these are not hard things for us to do. We don't have to have a detailed spec. But just using a spec as a communication device so that we're very explicit in what we're talking about goes a long way. One, it makes sure that you know, the language that you're using is the same. Martin Thompson and I to the, to this evening for our keynote will talk about some of the things that we have done with Aaron. And one of the things that we have done is we spend a lot of time working on naming. We argue about names. We, it matters to us. Words matter. So taking this idea of, of a spec, you can write it down, or it could be an email exchange, or it could be simply just checks exchanges. As long as you're thinking about and being very explicit about what you're doing, it helps tremendously. So I've seen projects that uh, have very, very detailed specs. In fact, to give you an idea, um, I was a full researcher. Uh, I had been around NASA for a, a few years. And I thought I kind of knew you know, teams and, and, and was there. And there I took a trip to Houston uh, to see, um, you know, some teams down there working on shuttle. And this was in the mid-90s. And they had a new intern. And this intern was 14 years old, very young, very young kid. And he had a smile 24-7. He was so happy to be working for NASA. It was, it was just contagious. He had a smile all the time. He, he was very, you know, very energetic. And I saw him was given an assignment. He was given an assignment to literally photocopy a stack of documents that was about this long, about this tall, and to put them in binders. And he, he thought this was incredible. He thought this was great. He was going to actually look at the documents that were done with Shuttle, some of the systems, and to see what engineers had developed. You know, from a, just the documentation. He was happy with this. He took great pride in, in doing this assignment, and he did a great job. You know, he was only photocopying documents and putting them in binders, but he took huge pride in doing that. Now, I looked at it as I'd seen a lot of those documents. The last thing I would want to do is to actually spend about six hours, you know, photocopying, hole punching, putting these in, in, in binders. This to him was great. This was the best thing ever. So he would love you know, to have looked at you know, some of the other documents that came out. Tremendously long specifications about, very detailed about how things should be done, how they work, and how they, you know, they don't work, and what is covered and what's not. You don't need all that. But sometimes you do to just get on the same page. Don't think that I'm saying that you have to have bad specs. You don't. You can have specs that are nothing more than an exchange of emails. Anything that gives you a little bit more formality on what you're talking about, or just something that you can look back on later and to look at and see what your thought process was. Even if it's something you write down in Evernote or you put into you know, things or you put into something, will do. Early requirements analysis. Once you have something and even just a informal way of talking. I, I spent a lot of time with analysts who would look at different documents a lot of times, but they would interview you know, um, 
team members. And less formalized interview than you would think. I have, I've seen analysts who their form of interview was they would take engineers to lunch. And they would talk about how the system works and what the assumptions were. The better analysts didn't, they didn't use the specification documents this tall and look through and go, this requirement here and that requirement there are totally against one another. Which one do you mean? There may have been some of that, but the best information they got and the thing that were the most valuable was finding issues just by talking to engineers. I'll give you an example. I was looking at analyzing source code for um, a device uh, that did GPS tracking that was going to be put on shuttle. And there, long story short, there, it was put on shuttle, it was flown, no one had done any IVNV on it, it turned into an issue, um, and so they were looking at later on what happened. The problems that we found came about by having this conversation. An engineer on one side who had originally done this, worked on this machine, uh, this box, about this big, um, and an analyst on the other side. And I was sort of just a fly on the wall. And the engineer was asked questions. What were some of the assumptions you make? Well, this is a really broad topic, right? What are the assumptions you make in a piece of code? And so the, the, there were certain assumptions that were top of mind. But one assumption, the engineer, when he said it, he thought uh, that could be a problem. And here was it. He said, well, we assumed that you would never see more than 12 satellites at a time. And, he, and his face literally fell because he realized that that's okay when you're at a low altitude. What happens when you're at a much, much higher altitude? You see more satellites. Why did his face drop? If you had hard-coded a constant in your code, like 12, and all of a sudden you're at 15, and that happened to be an array index, you're now scribbling over the end of it into random memory. So this had nothing to do with re reading requirements documents. It had everything to do with asking an open-ended question to someone who knows exactly what that, what that looks like, and then getting them to sort of think, what was my assumptions? What was I thinking? And then all of a sudden, them realizing, even before you could put the pieces together, that that's a potential problem. And from that, all kinds of different things avalanche, right? You realize all of a sudden that it's not simply that it's the number of satellites, it's how fast they're being acquired and deacquired. It's the differential between the different signals and the differences there and the assumptions there. All these things kind of avalanche. So it has nothing to do with having detailed specs. It has everything to do with asking open-ended questions, being able to actually pinpoint where there might be a problem and to you know, sort of just get out you know, just uh, something as simple as, what, what were you thinking? Not in a bad way, what were you thinking, but in a, so what, guide me through your thought process. So that, that was the pointy hair boss kind of thing. Here's some suggestions of things I've seen, I've seen work real well. Test-driven development, behavior-driven driven development. This can be a spec. I have seen projects that the actual specs were actually test cases. Now, we think about them from a J-unit perspective or a whole bunch of tests like that, but think about it from a, a, a standing back that if I apply these inputs in these order, I should see this output. That is tremendously powerful. That can be your spec. So you don't have to actually you know, spend a whole bunch of time. I can tell you every single project that has had a very rigid process I have seen has failed because it is the intent of what the Agile Manifesto talks about. Not the fact that you have scrums or the fact that you have stand-ups on a daily basis or any of these other things. It actually has to do with the fact that you want to value certain things over other things. And when you value those, from what I've seen, that's resulted in pride, ownership, and accountability. Language discussions are great. But rise above them. Just because you're picking a certain language, even though I know that we all love Java and the JVM, rise above that. 
you know, we, also, we all want the tool that we use to be the best. And we all, all want everyone else to realize that as well, especially when we like it. But rise above it. Language discussions are great, but when you get to the point where you think someone else is, you know, using an inferior language in that they're risking certain things, realize this, most critical systems are written in assembly in C. They're not great languages, especially assembly, but we actually do rely a lot of times on much less inferior languages than we would tote. And the same thing with functional and OOP. There's a lot of things we can learn from functional programming. There's a lot of things we can learn from the concept, the pure concept of object-oriented programming, especially in terms of communicating with messages versus you know, sharing state. But rise above that. It's good technique and it's good discussion, but when it gets to the point where you can't think that you can do anything good a certain way, you're probably missing something. And just because you have a spec or you have a whole set of, you know, of tests, realize that it's not the actual test, it's not the spec, it's not the requirements themselves, it's the actual act of getting it. Dwight D. Eisenhower's famous quote of the planning, the plan is nothing, planning is everything, has a corollary to us. It is the spec is nothing, the writing of the spec is everything. That, co that communication mechanism, that's what helps us. The last concrete suggestion I'll make is this. Develop good taste. Develop that sense of when you see good code, you know it. Why? What makes it good? What makes it quality? You know, spend time thinking about this. Taste matters. We all know what good code looks like. Because we can tell. If, if I put up code and I say, does this look good? You'd have an opinion about it. It's very subjective, but develop it. And to sort of leave us, I'll leave this. Quote from Steve Jobs. Now, whatever you might think about Apple or Steve Jobs, you gotta admit that, you know, that Apple put out some very nice products. Now, they, compared to others, you know, had some good quality. And this, the idea that you know, if you're a carpenter, making a beautiful chest of drawers, you're not going to use a piece of plywood on the back, right? Quality has to be taken all the way through, even something that you may not see. In software, I think a lot of this is the same. We have to look at it from the beginning all the way through. Variable naming, method naming, how many variables you use, is a code easy to maintain or not? You know. A lot of these things come through, and it all comes down to taste, good taste. We know what looks bad. Heck, we even have competitions to obfuscate code, right, to make it so it's hard to figure out what it's doing. This is the opposite of that. We want to make it so it's easily seen what's going on. We want it to be simple. We want it to be elegant. We all want that. And I think that it's incredibly important for us to develop that. Because what happens when you do that? You know, if you have, you know, the wherewithal to do exactly this, instead of using a piece of plywood on the back of a chest of drawers, to do something that is nice on that back, even though you, you know, no one else will see it but you, what does that show? Pride, ownership, responsibility, right? That's what's there. It says an awful lot about us. So before, you know, we have, you know, potentially governments giving us dictates about what we, how we need to do things, or us being accountable for how, you know, for what we do, like a lot of other engineers. We have to take it upon ourselves to do these things and to be better. Thank you. <laughs>